Welcome to the debut episode of the Evidentiary Podcast. I'm part of the team of hosts. My name is Leslie, and I run a blog called Unsolved Appalachia, which details the missing, murdered, and unidentified persons of the Appalachian region. You can check it out at unsolvedappalachia.org if you are so inclined. But uh, I think you're going to enjoy what we've got in store for you here. My name is Anthony, and I run the blog called CrimeBlogger1983.blogspot.com, and it covers basically missing persons, but I do cover other things upon request, such as murders and, and other things. Me and Leslie kind of were introduced to a mutual friend of ours, Andrea, and I think we're going to I'll go ahead and give her a shout-out. She's the one that got us, both of us interested in the case, and her, her blog is Whereabouts Still Unknown. If you just Google that, I don't know if it's .com or .org, I don't remember, do you? It's WordPress, I think. Yeah, it's WordPress. We can link her. Yeah, yeah, we'll link you. But she does an amazing amount of work. She's been real busy lately, too. I've noticed. I've got a lot of emails. Do you see that? Yeah. You get emails, too? Yeah. Yeah, she's been real busy. But she's great, and Leslie's great. But like she said, we hope you'll enjoy what we do here. We do dedicate a lot of our time to these types of cases, and this will mainly be a missing persons podcast, but we might, we might go into something else in terms of, like, murders or something sometime down the road, but mostly it's going to be a missing persons podcast. So, so, um, Leslie, how did you, um, how did you get into the missing persons, uh, arena? Well, it all started a long time ago. I've actually always been really interested in unsolved mysteries. Uh, I mean, thanks in part to Robert Stack. I grew up watching unsolved mysteries, but when I was a child, there was actually a man that went missing in our town and he has never been found to this day but just the fact that something like that could happen so close to home uh, and it, you know it kind of ebbed over the years and I got back into it a few years ago just I, I found Namus and started looking at people who had actually been reported missing close to where I'm from and was just absolutely astounded at the amount of people and how there was literally no information about them anywhere online so I thought hey you know this is my chance to attempt to make a difference to uh, spread their memory and hopefully bring some closure. If nothing else, it brings awareness that they're still missing and their families are still looking for them. It almost seems unheard of somebody can just disappear in this day and age, but it happens all the time right. still. It's crazy. What's your, um, do you have any type of or number of pet cases that are close to you that got you into it? Well, um, I think the one that first hit me the hardest when I very first started was, uh, his name was Kelly Holland Jr. And he was six when he disappeared. And he oh. just disappeared out the front of his yard. Um, so that was my first case that really got me back into this all of those cases are rough but the ones with the kids that really get me oh yeah that really just kills you it's just it's crazy how somebody can just disappear it doesn't make any sense of course they don't disappear but you know yeah nobody finds them uh, and you're just like well, how does that happen yeah like how do you how do you disappear for 40 plus years and and absolutely no trace of you ever gets found right so what about you how did you get into this almost identical to what you said about you know robert stack and unsolved mysteries mysteries I love those types of those types of cases and those stories, but the one that I did the longest, I've been working on the longest, is Tammy Leppert, and that was because of Unsolved Mysteries, because of the episode from Unsolved Mysteries on her. She was the, the actress that was in Scarface for a, a brief scene, and she was an up-and-coming model, and she ended up disappearing after uh, taking a ride with a supposed friend. And that was in 1984. They haven't uh, heard from her since, and she's still missing. So I plugged away years on that one. Mm -hmm. um, last couple of years, since I started the blog and so on, it, it's it's ramped up. But I had a notebook on Tammy for a long time. That one really got to me, got me interested in it, really. Uh, I've talked to her sisters and so on. I even did an episode of Unfound with Ed Denzel on the case. Um, if they want to check that out, they can. But yeah, Tammy Leopard, there's a couple others. I usually, I like the older cases seem to interest me a lot more. Tammy's is 1984, so depending upon how old you are. To me, that doesn't seem like a long time ago, but to some people it would be. But the older ones, like the 60s and the 50s ones, Evelyn Hartley, Joan Risch, those ones are really fascinate me. And I did another episode of Unfound with uh, Ed on Evelyn Hartley, too. So if they want to check that out, they can do that, too. And those might be some cases that um, we revisit on this podcast. So how long have you been doing the, the blog, Leslie? Oh, I started the blog in October of last year. So a little over a year now. Most of her cases, I'll tell you, everybody listening, there is nothing on her case. Most of her cases, it is literally zero. So a lot of the cases I feature uh, have a good amount of, you know, something out there that you can at least form a story around and, and research. And hers are just hers are so obscure like there's been times leslie will attest to it that she messaged me out looking up some articles seeing if i can find anything and there's if i can't find nothing that's going to be hard uh, and most yep. of the time there's nothing on there it's crazy I hope it really frustrates me didn't you say you one time you contacted a law enforcement person and they didn't even know the name of the case it was, yeah and they're yep 
Isn't yeah. that crazy? Yeah, it was. It was one of those disheartening moments for you. Like, if uh, if the police force that's assigned this case has no clue who this guy is, how's he ever going to be recovered? Yeah, and there's a, I just think that a lot of respect or a lot of props need to be given to researchers like yourself and Andrea and a lot of other people that do these cases. Because literally, you and I have both done it. I'm sure Andrea has too. And you reach out to a family member and they're just so thankful that somebody reached out to them that cared, you yeah. know, that wants to try to help them they're just uh, enormously grateful for it it's a nice feeling but at the same time it's almost like oh, i'm just somebody that reads stuff online and, and blogs i'm a, I'm like a lazy detective but you know it's, it's nice to help people but it, you feel bad because you know you're like if lazy old me can try to help this person and, and they're so grateful for it i wish law enforcement would do something else right you know they've got do a little bit more. so much more at their fingertips that they can actually use and utilize to find information and and it's just so disheartening when you know that there's cases sitting there with nothing and and like you said you know you contact family members and they've not heard from law enforcement for years and you just pop them yeah. out of the blue i mean yeah they're they're very, they're very thankful but it's just, it's just sad all around Right. Some of the cases, too, where law enforcement just leaves things open, like in Tammy's case, the, the person that she left with has never been questioned by police, and that was the last person that was with her. They've never once questioned this person, and it's like, really? Mm-hmm. That You think that'd be the first thing that they would do, last person she was with, you think they'd call or question or even try to, you know, right. catch up with them. To this day, to my knowledge, they've never, ever questioned him regarding it. It's just wild. Yeah. So I figure we can break into the case that we're going to cover today. Andrew is the one that gave us, got us both into this case big time, and we've plugged away at it for a while. Big shout out to, to Andrea. She's a sweetheart. This is our first episode, so, uh, but we'll get better as we go along for sure. All right. So today we are going to be covering the disappearance of Michael Jefferson Adams, who vanished from Abilene, Texas on June 8th, 1987. A little background on this case information. I've I've been in contact with a few of Michael's family members, Howard, his father in particular, and he is in his 90s. His biological mother and his stepmother have both since passed away, and and he's still wanting to find out what happened to Michael. So this is one case we plan to cover, but we've kind of sped it up and we threw this in the front just because of, obviously, he's in his 90s. And we want to try to help any way we can try to get some answers to what happened to to his son. So that's what we'll be covering today. Did you want to go ahead and uh, cover the beginning background on Mike, Leslie? Sure. Michael Jefferson Adams, he went by Mike. He was born March the 28th, 1969. Mike stood around 6 foot 1, weighed around 150 pounds. He was blonde-haired, blue-eyed. He had contacts. He was a a very handsome young man, Mike was. At the time of his disappearance, he resided at 1250 Peach Street in Abilene, Texas, and was employed at the M-System store on Mockingbird Lane and North 12th Street. The store is no longer there, but when it was there, it was located in Abilene. He was actually a recent graduate of Cooper High School and had plans to attend a Texas Tech University. He was in the marching band. He was a pianist, an artist. He was interested in architecture, and he planned on being an architect at Texas Tech, but sadly, he never got that chance. Texas Tech, go Red Raiders. I'm a big Red Raiders fan, so that's pretty cool. You can look at a lot of the um, information on this case. I profiled him on my blog. I think even if you Google his name, mine's the first entry, I think, that comes up. It may be one one or two. I don't know. Leslie, what's your initial impressions of Mike just looking at pictures of him? What do you think? You said he was a pretty handsome oh, young man. Was, I, I would agree with that. He just looked so open. He looked warm and friendly. He he just looked like a, a person that you could just take to and just be friend. And, yeah, he just he looked like a just stand-up guy. Yeah, he does. He looks like somebody you would just, um, like a neighborhood kid or something, yeah. or even a good buddy that you'd have in school that you would just cut up with all day. He looked like a really, really friendly guy, and you're right. He doesn't look like the kind of guy that would have an enemy in the world, to be honest with you. It's crazy. No, and from everything that we've been able to find out, you know, he's a pretty straight arrow kid. Yeah, he looked um, like he looked like a kid that didn't have a, an enemy in the world, and like you said, by all accounts, he seemed to pretty be a just straight arrow kid. Mm-hmm. We saw those marching band videos, too, yeah. which is pretty cool. It, he was really good, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it sound. broke my heart. Yeah, I've got six kids, so I can't imagine ever having to live with that. I don't think I could. It's just uh, my heart aches for Howard Adams. And if you ever, a lot of the interviews with Howard are on YouTube, and I've got a couple on my on my webpage. He is just what you call a good old-fashioned Southern gentleman. Mm-hmm. He is one of the nice guys you could ever talk to. And for something like this to happen to him, it's just not right. It really isn't. On the night of June 8, 1987, Mike was the closing supervisor at the M System store on Mockingbird Lane. The store closed at 10 p.m., and Mike reportedly made it home by 11 p.m., which sounds about right. If you close a store, usually there's about an hour, and you got to count all the money and make sure everything's locked up and so on. So Mike was last seen by his stepsister, Beverly Adams, through her bedroom window. 
Mike was standing next to a car that was parked on their street, and he seemed to be talking to whoever was in the car. Beverly was asleep initially when she heard the car pull up, and there was a car that came in behind Mike that didn't park in the driveway but was on the side of the street. Mike seemed to be leaning against the car and talking to somebody, and by all accounts, Beverly thought that whoever he was speaking with, that he apparently knew because he seemed relaxed and he he wasn't anxious or anything, so she just went back to sleep. But from what she can um, remember about the vehicle, and I guess she did undergo hypnosis, later on but the car was described as an older model gm it had opera style windows the car was or closely resembled a monte carlo there seemed to be like a flashing light uh, either a defect in the headlight that made the headlights flash mm-hmm. or there was a flickering of the lights either manually or like i said by defect i'm not sure which but and for people that don't under, don't know what um opera style windows are they're basically windows that were on two-door cars at the time for those older cars that didn't have four doors Leslie probably remembers where if it was just a larger two-door car that you put the seat forward and, and the persons would get in the back. So they didn't have a door of their own. So um, they have these windows that were called opera windows that were smaller windows for the people in the back that were sitting could still look out. But those were described as triangular, which kind of matched what a Monte Carlo would be with opera style windows. Mike at the time, he knew two people who owned similar cars. One was a co-worker named Cheeto Allard, which we'll go into him a little bit later. And this will actually, something I forgot to mention, this will be a two-parter. Um, basically, the opening to introduce you to me and Leslie, and then we'll give you the beginning parts of, of Mike's case. And then part two will come a little bit later, and then we'll delve back into the, the suspects and the day and, and so on. But Cheeto Alarden was one of the people that was known to have a, a similar car, and he was a co-worker. And another one was a, a former friend of Michael's named Ernest Morgan. We'll get more into them later. Um, But according to law enforcement, they uh, have some tips. Law enforcement believes that there was probably just one person in that car, but other tips have led people to believe that there were probably two. The uh, the unknown car, which was a Monte Carlo type, was probably possibly brown or gray in color, but like I said, it was dark at night. She woke up. She's probably groggy as well. And I'm not real big on hypnosis, so I don't know how much of this is recalled from un- from being under hypnosis. She uh, she didn't like I said Mike didn't appear anxious or anything. So um, she kind of basically went back to sleep. She's the last known person to have seen Michael alive. He wasn't seen after that. The next morning, Barbara got up for work, and uh, it was customary when Mike came home from work to pull in and move her car out so he could pull his car in because she worked in the mornings. That way, it'd be easier for her to get out. Um, when she got woke the next morning on the 9th, his car was still behind her, so she went to wake him, and they discovered he wasn't there. There's some things to keep in mind, I guess. We can give you a little bit of information on Cheeto and Steve. Cheeto, he was a co-worker of Mike's. He was interviewed on the Missing Reward episode that you can look at on Anthony's blog, or you can actually find it on YouTube. Hopefully we'll get our own website up, and I can include it on there. But Cheeto did work the night that Mike closed the store. Cheeto was parked in the parking lot the night Mike went missing, along with Abel Gonzalez. Abel Gonzalez was actually a worker of M Systems, but he did not work at that store. And I'm not sure if he worked that night, but he did not work at that store, so that's something else you want to keep in mind. All three of those guys, they left the parking lot at the same time. And Cheeto actually was given a polygraph, and he did pass it. He did pass it, we know. And then we've got Steve. Um, Yeah, Steve's the supervisor. He's, he's my supervisor. He was the one that actually that day sent Mike home earlier that day, the day that Mike went missing because Mike was wearing khaki colored pants and Steve made him return home to change into black pants, which were, I guess, part of the store's dress code policy. Right. But I don't think... Uh, Too little strange. Yeah. Mike didn't really get along with him. Right. Yeah, he didn't seem to get along with him a whole lot at all. I mean, I've never seen an interview with Steve I did find some of his social media. I do have a number for him. I did try to contact him through social media, but he didn't respond. Right. So I don't know how often he checks it. So yeah. So I think actually Mike was Mike was he was planning to uh, send a letter into corporate regarding the morale of the store, but decided against it. And I, I don't think Steve was ever given a polygraph either. And, no, he wasn't. He wasn't given one. Yeah. And then uh, on the and the big kicker on this one is he was fired not long after Mike's disappearance for embezzlement. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. If you watch the Missing Reward episode, the whole beginning part of it picks up where Mike comes back home to change his clothes, and he's talking to Howard and uh, his mom, Barbara, 
and he's talking about how much he doesn't like Steve, how much he feels like basically the morale of the store is pretty low, and he feels that Steve went out of his way to embarrass him mm-hmm. in front of everybody. And Mike was the closing supervisor, so he, he was in a leadership position, and I've worked with people like that that like to – usually they feel threatened by you if you're under them and you're in a, in a leadership position at the store, and um, they try to humiliate you or set you up to fail. Right. as often as they can, just because it makes them feel good about themselves, I guess. I don't know. I never really understood it, but I've been in spots like that myself to where um, if, if you're a real go-getter, they feel threatened with it, and then they try to embarrass you as much. So that kind of seems like that might be what the situation was with Steve. I don't know. But just from what I've been able to uncover, Steve seemed like a, a guy that a boss you probably wouldn't want to have. Right. right. But it could be a, a just that job. I don't know. It could have been a bad company. They're no longer in business. There, there are a couple of M-System stores in Texas, but I don't think it's the same company. Right. So. But for the embezzlement thing, is interesting. And another thing is uh, they mentioned on the missing reward episode is that um, a couple of days prior, Mike Mike was the front end manager, and he was the one that closes the front end. But he, I guess, he would try to keep an eye on the rest of the store, which is natural if you're a leader in the store. Right. Um, but apparently, Mike noticed or actually saw somebody stealing something out of the back. Uh, the back, And it was alcohol, basically. And he, uh, I guess, Mike never indicated that he, the person who was stealing, but he, he did bring that up to Steve, and Steve uh, reprimanded him for being in the back. So that that's kind of interesting. You think if you catch somebody stealing or, or there's a theft back there, that he would be a little more congratulatory or appreciative of Mike, right. but apparently he... I, I yeah. just, I, I don't understand the whole being reprimanded for being in the back. I mean, if you work in a store, there could be plenty of reasons that you need to go to the back. I go to the back where I work all the time, and I'm never reprimanded for being back there. You know, if, if your job calls for you to, to do something back there, or it's, it's all the same store. You work there, so why are certain parts of the store off limits? I don't understand. Right. Right. Well, if you've taken the county of Prior for embezzling, not long after, maybe maybe some other people are taking advantage of the store as well. That's Who knows? true. But that that does seem to be an awfully interesting thing to happen for Mike being alert like that. It seems like Mike should be running the show and not Steve, but that's yeah. just me. I guess Mike never actually indicated who it was that he caught stealing, but it was alcohol that was being stolen. So that kind of brings makes me think that it's probably younger kids. Right. I mean, stealing alcohol, that's usually something they would do. But what did... Um, I saw on the Missing Reward episode, we mentioned it quite a few times already, they do interview Cheeto. Um, what's, what's your impression of the interview with Cheeto? What do you think? There's a, there was a lot of points in the video that he, he did seem to kind of ramble on. I don't know if that was because he was, maybe he was nervous because he was being interviewed. I don't, I don't know. I just, there was a lot of stuff that he said that I had a hard time really buying into. Yeah, I agree. He, uh, he brings up something interesting, too, about the, the night they left the parking lot. I guess he says that there's been conflicting statements on how he said they left. You know, at times, um, I guess, according to reports, you know, um, they were all in the parking lot. They all left in their cars at the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the Missing Reward episode, I guess he says that they talked a little bit outside. And I guess Mike went to his car and offered him a warm beer that was in the trunk. And he said he didn't want to. He went down with warm beer or something like that. Right. That's, that's an interesting aspect in itself because some of the people that I've talked to, classmates of, of Mike and so on, said he wasn't a big beer drinker. So that's kind of odd that he'd have warm beer in the back of his trunk. Even in the Missing Reward video, Cheeto talks about how it surprised him that Mike drank. So it's... Yeah, he said he tried to get him to go out with him a few times and he didn't want to. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's contradictory. Right. And you wonder, I mean, Cheeto was one of the people that worked in the back room. I'm sure there was others, too. But right. he worked in the back room, apparently. So, who knows? I always wonder, did Mike catch him him stealing or, and didn't want to say anything? Or, or was it somebody else? I don't know. But the beer aspect is interesting because, you know, the Missing Rewards episode shows that it's alcohol that's being taken. Uh, they don't mention it, you know, in the narration. But uh, you can see a kid go over there and pick up alcohol and you see the guy that plays Mike watching him do it. So for him to bring up that aspect of beer, it seems like it's almost like he could be, you could interpret it as him trying to deflect away maybe, or at least accuse Mike of possibly having something to do with the theft. I don't know. Right. That's how I took it. Um, 
But you're right. He does seem to be a pretty shady, at least in that interview now. I know that they can edit things and make you seem not so good at times, so it's hard to go off just based on an interview. Right. But he, he does seem kind of shifty regarding, you know, his eyes. And, and apparently um, the prior night he talked, remember that story he told about Mike saying that there was somebody out in the parking lot that was causing trouble, and I guess he went and got Cheeto, and by the time Cheeto came out there, there was nobody out there, and he kind of razzed Mike about it, yeah, you know, where yeah, to go. Yeah, so... He said that if something was going down, that he always tried to be the first to be there, that he didn't want, he wasn't being nosy, which is interesting, but um, he wasn't being nosy, he just wanted to make sure nobody got hurt. But apparently by the time Cheeto got out there, I guess, there was nobody uh, out there, which, you know, looking at Mike, I mean, I know store policy and all kinds of stuff. If something like that happens, I guess you automatically go out there or go back to get somebody. But just looking at Michael and and talking to his friends and, and Howard, um, to me, he doesn't, I know that if it's policy, he probably would go get somebody. But to me, it doesn't look like the way they portrayed it or the way that Cheetah was telling the story, it seemed like Mike, Mike was scared of something and, from what I've heard, and just by, you know, things I know about, Mike doesn't seem to be easily intimidated. I mean, he he wasn't a really big guy, but he's a good-sized kid. Right. I mean, he's a healthy-looking healthy kid. I mean, so, I mean, it made it seem like he was just, you know, running back to Cheeto yeah. to, you know, come help me. And, and that didn't... Mike didn't strike me as that kind of a kid. No, he's uh, he doesn't seem like he would, he would run and cower. He's... No. In fact, I talked to one of his high school friends. She said that Mike could handle himself if things got if it got physical. Um, right. You know, not not that he was a badass or he'd take on three or four guys, but she said she saw seen him handle somebody that was a little bigger than him, uh, and it wasn't too hard for him to do so. So if if things got physical, uh, he could handle himself. It just that that part of Cheeto's statement seemed kind of kind of odd, or it could have be just the way that they portrayed it on the, right. on the episode. I don't know, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem like, um, especially him being the front end supervisor the closing supervisor i think he would be able to just take initiative himself i don't think he'd go run to get somebody in the back room but right. who knows the, the abel gonzalez aspect of this is really interesting because the missing reward episode does not mention abel at all no but apparently he was there and we'll, we'll go into him in part two a little bit more they didn't cover him in the missing reward episode but he he has since passed away and it was in a uh in a rafting accident years later about i think it was 1994 and it was it may sound a little more conspiratorial than I intended to be, but he was supposed to actually talk to a private investigator the family had hired, and a day before he was supposed to be interviewed, he ended up passing away in the in the rafting accident right. in Arizona. I do have the article on the blog, so but that's interesting. I, I just wonder if he would have. What do you think? Do you think he would have been able to bring anything else into light? Do you think he may have known more about what may have happened to Mike? Or I mean, the the fact that he was wanting to speak to a private investigator. That, to me, suggests that he might have known more than he had told the police, and maybe he did want to clear his conscience. I think it's really tragic that he did pass away before he could say anything, because he might have been able to just tie all the loose ends up and, and bring Mike home and, and give his family some peace. Right. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. I mean, I wanted to, one of the, you know, you always want to, as people, and people in general, our brains are hardwired to try to find patterns and things, and when you hear that initially, you're like, whoa, uh, you know? Right. That's interesting. That's convenient, but okay. things like that do happen. It, it they do, okay. and I mean, how would you? I don't know. How would you sabotage a raft? Right. That exactly. Just, I just think it's. It was just one of those things. It just it happened, and it's really strange that it happened. But it it's just one of those things. It it just. Things like that do happen, though. People. That's where I think a lot of the conspiracy theories get born is because people. Try we've, to make we, it. And we've discussed this. Uh, right. Yeah, they're going to try to make it something into something that it's not. Right. You know, we, we've talked about it. We, we're we're kind of into the same thing, me and Leslie, in terms of like conspiracies and stuff like that. We love talking about that stuff, but neither of us are conspiracy theorists by any no. means. We always get a chuckle out of some of that stuff. We always laugh it off. What was your. Uh, I know you haven't spoken to Howard Adams, but what's your impression of him from the Missing or Reward episode? I just want to hug him. Yeah. He's just so heartbroken. And. I feel like at this point in his life, he's just holding out to try and, and yeah. be there when his son's found. Yeah. It's really hard talking to him uh, the few times that I have because he is remarkably sharp for a man in his 90s. Uh, first off, I hope I live to be in my 90s. And, and second off, if I do, I hope my mind is as quick as it Howard because he's, he's sure got that quick southern wit going on. He, the only thing, he'll warm up to you after a while. When I end up getting a hold of him, uh, he ended up calling me. And that's never happened before. I had reached out to one of one of Michael's high school friends, and he doesn't know much about the case, but he's like, I do see Howard around town every now and then, and I do have his number. So it's like, I, if you want, 
I can give you your number if he wants to call you. He'll call you. I was like, yeah, that's no problem. And I'm literally, 10 minutes after that message was sent, he, I get a call from Abilene, and I answer it, and it's Howard. So he still has a lot of energy to try to figure out what happened to his son, and it, it's really hard um, because you can hear at times his voice right. crack and so on. It's just, it's heartbreaking, and this, it's just, wow. But he is, you're right. I want to hug him on the phone. You know, he's he is a really a tremendous person. He was also employed as a manager at another M System store, the other one in Abilene, if I remember correctly. And he got Michael the job at that store that he was working at at Mockingbird Lane. And Howard is familiar with Steve, Mike's supervisor, Steve. Um, he didn't know him very well, and he didn't say anything bad about him. Uh, the only thing that was should be taken into consideration is when the, the local police asked for Mike's personnel file. Right. Mike's was completely empty, which is really odd. You think there'd be evaluations or at least the, the, the yeah the application and the paperwork for when he was hired. That should have definitely been in there. Yeah, and I guess Howard asked Steve about that, and Steve was like, he never had, he, uh, I guess he interpreted it as, he said basically that Mike was such a good employee that he never had to keep tabs on him, that he always did everything he was supposed to do, which which it seems odd, since considering the, the same Although, day that he disappeared, he had to come home and change his clothes, apparently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you like someone that well, then why do you give them so much trouble when they're working with you? Exactly. So, I, I don't know why to take that, but and, and not to mention, like, We've stated before, Michael was wanting to send a, uh, a letter into corporate regarding the morale of the store, and, and, and so on. I guess he decided mm-hmm. against it, which is, which you know, another thing, give him credit. <laughs> when I was younger, I would have went straight over somebody's head like that, but he seemed to be a little more uh, level-headed than I would have been. I would have went to corporate, but I think he may have viewed it as, you know, uh, you want to pick your battles, I guess. Right. I don't know. And uh, that's probably a smart thing to do. But, yeah, it couldn't have been all happy-go-lucky between Mike and Steve. It didn't sound like that at all. No. So, but I don't know what to take of the, the personnel file being empty. That just, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, what could have possibly been in there that could have incriminated anyone? Uh, I don't understand. Or why would they want to get rid of it? Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just doesn't make sense. There should have been at least a couple of pieces of paper in there. Right. And, and Steve, like we said, he's the one that was not given a polygraph test. Now, I don't know how to interpret that, whether... He was, you know, he could never have been actually offered to be given right. a polygraph test. He may have just focused on the people that were working with, you know, Mike that night right. or, or something like that. So I don't know how to interpret that. But I think I can speak for myself and probably you too, Leslie. You, you're not big on polygraphs, are you? No, not really. Yeah. So I think the fact that Cheeto passed his is not something that I'm going to be really big on. I mean, I think you can. I mean, you, you, can, you can beat a polygraph. I I think they're useful maybe if you're trying to put pressure on someone, but to actually right. to take that as gospel is not. I mean, why else are they in admissible in court proceedings now? You know? Right, they're not admissible at all. They're they're used as I think the law enforcement says they're used as a tool for investigative purposes, but they can't be. The results can't be used in a right. court of law at all. Right. And there's been lots of people that were guilty that passed polygraph tests too. So, mm-hmm. not saying that Cheeto is guilty right now, but you know. I I, just, I don't hold that aspect in high degree when you look at that aspect. Right. What did you think, going back to the, the parking lot, I don't know if I asked you, what did you think of Cheeto's story about the beer and so on? What did you think about that? Uh, I don't I don't really buy it. Yeah, it's hard for me too I just, as well. I don't, I don't see Mike being the type of guy who to just, I don't know, just something about Mike and something about Cheeto, they don't look like they're just bosom buddies that you would just... I mean, if, I wonder. I just wonder what time Cheeto got off work. Did he close that night with Mike? I mean, why was he still? No, he got off. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a that's a very good point. No, actually, um, from what I I can ascertain is they um, the store closed. Let me look at my notes again. The store closed, I believe, at ten. Um, ten, and he was at the parking lot at at ten thirty. So yeah, it seems like I don't know what he's doing hanging out there. Him him and Abel. I don't know what they're still doing in the parking. Maybe they're just chilling. I don't know. But it seems kind of odd that they would all leave at the same time. Like, I wouldn't think too much of that if Mike had to go drop a deposit off at a bank or something. Mm-hmm. But he didn't have to do that. So, yeah, I don't know why they're chilling. And they all leave at the same time. And they all had – all three of them had separate cars, apparently. Because one account says that um, one of them left first and then uh, Mike left second. And then the other one left third. So they're, they've got basically – Mike's in between both cars. And – and apparently they lived close in the same neighborhood, too, because um, I guess Cheeto was talking about how, you know, in the rewards video, missing reward, that uh, when they got stopped at a stoplight, they started revving up each other's engines, acting like they're going to race. Right. And then I guess Mike's turn was before Cheeto, so I guess Cheeto says he saw him turn into a, a street, 
that would lead to the neighborhood where his house is. And then he kept going home. So, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe to me, like he said in the video, Cheeto always, Cheeto said that he always tried to get him to come out and have a drink with him. And he always said no. So he's like, that would caught me by surprise that he had some beer in his trunk because he didn't think he drank. Right. Uh, to me, looking at the situation, he seems like the kind of guy that Mike would be okay working with, but he just would not like to hang out with him. We all have those people, you know, whether, you know, you're, they're, they're okay to deal with at work, but, you know, you wouldn't want to be hanging out hanging with out them. Hanging out with them, yeah. So that's just how I, I look at it. But Cheeto, like I said, the interview made him look real shifty with the eyes and the nosy thing really stands out to me. He's like, I didn't, yeah. I'm not trying to be nosy. I just, uh, nobody said you were trying to be nosy. He called you to come out, you know? Right. Like, that's not being nosy. Supposedly, that's what he's saying anyway. So so if you take the nosy thing and kind of, I know you can, if you're trying to pick things apart and put them together to fit a certain theory, which I'm not trying to do, but if you take the nosy aspect of what he said, the nosy thing, and, and you take into account that Mike caught somebody stealing in the back room, one could, you know, almost see that maybe Cheeto's trying to, you know, imply something there, but I don't know. That may be a stretch. Right. But the, the nosy thing out of nowhere just seemed kind of odd to me for him to say that because Mike supposedly came to him to get help for some situation in the parking lot or so he says. So. But I think that's where we'll leave off so far, and then we'll have part two coming soon. And then it'll be a little bit longer because we'll go into all kinds of stuff. All three of us have plugged away at this one, so we've got plenty of information to, to share. You know, these podcasts that we'll be doing going forward, if, if you've read my blog, Leslie's blog is a little different. She's She wants to give you the 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 basically the facts of the case and she'll give you her opinion too but i'm what you call a little <laughs> more opinionated <laughs> about my opinions so um i don't really hold back so like with our podcast going forward leslie's real sweet about how she does hers and she's real classy i i can get, i can get down in the dirt if you want to get down in the dirt so if there's a problem with anything we say on the podcast or that i say come at me don't go with leslie all right because you first off I'm the one that has the strong opinions between the two of us. She has strong opinions, but she's classy about it. So I'm always down for a fight. You want to pick a fight? Pick a fight with me. Don't don't go after her. But I'm a little more opinionated. I don't think we'll have that. Most of the listeners will be cool. I don't think, I mean, everybody has their trolls and stuff. But like I said, my opinions are pretty strong. If you read my blog, you'll, you'll get it. So. And you, you love trolls. Oh, I love trolls. They're fun. <laughs> I never back down from a fight. No, no, we see when it on we your website. Go. I love reading the comments on your blog. Oh, yeah. They think they're going to frustrate me, and I just, I love a fight, so I guess that. But, yeah, don't mess with Leslie. Mess with me. That's all, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. And I think that's what we'll leave off, and then we will hear back from you guys soon. And then we'll probably have a sign-off and everything by then. But for right yeah. now, see you later.